but today I'm advertising for Black and Novell. Thank you. That's a, that's a big, that's a One of the old guys that taught me everything that I knew about gambling asked me this. He said, Melvin, do you plan to have a lot of money? I said, it's inevitable. He said, do you plan to have women and different people call you from all different parts of the world? I said, yeah. He said, then you're planning in reverse. Mm. And I'm going to be a week to figure that out. I said, come on, what do you mean in reverse? And so I said, well, I'm not going to be able to figure that out in a week because I don't have the mindset. I know if I can't figure it out right now, I won't be able to figure it out in a week. He said, well, this is what I'm going to give you. When you do something and you plan to enjoy it, you defeat the purpose. When you hit the number, you're going to like that. And everybody around you is going to like it. He said, you got to plan for something shitty so that you can stop it right away. you got to plan for the door to come off the hinge while the package is on the table. So that you can make arrangements about that. You can you got a plan for little Joe to have his Uzi and you and your crew getting ready to get out of the car so that you can disrupt that. And he said, and this is the last thing that I want you to know. If you see me 30 years from now and I don't have any money and you got so much of it is scary, as I do. and I ask you for some, or anybody else asks you for some, the only thing that we don't want you to do is die with all this information. But it's in the book that you can get right here, the black and no black. Uh, my name's Phil Leaf. I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins University, but I came by to see my friend Melvin Williams for his book signing. Uh, because although there's a lot of things in his book here, what he's doing now in terms of really creating some stability in a neighborhood and creating opportunities for young people are things that I don't think he put in his book because it's a different kind of book. But he's really an invaluable person for us involved. He's been putting together some programs, one around trying to make sure youth understand law issues uh, and, and, and what they should be doing if they get picked up. But more importantly, you just have to walk around with them and see not just the old people, but the young people come up to them and talk to them. Uh, and they sort of know what he used to do but he talks to them now about what he's doing now. And he has a youth program running in his building. Uh, and that's sort of an important thing. He's, he's being a positive role model for, for older folks, uh, as well as creating opportunities for young people. Do you think that we'll ever teach him in colleges or teach about him in colleges? Uh, I teach him about him in college. I mention him in my course. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm sure he's in the law books <laughs> for other reasons. Uh, but I think in terms of just him, him being an engaging person and helping link up folks that he knows and, and putting in a good word, I mean, uh, when I do stuff in a neighborhood, if somebody like him says positive things about me, it goes a long way uh, because people really trust him. How do they respond to when you talk to him about him? How do they respond to students? Uh, well, they, they sort of, uh, I don't think, quite un understand what was going on. But they can sort of see, particularly when they look at what he's actually doing now, uh, how people can change their lives around. Uh, but also, I mean, one of the things he's really known for is his word. You know, if he says something, that that that, that you can go to the bank on it. Uh, and that's an important people for both young people and other people to understand. Regardless of what you're doing, uh, your word, your words, your bond. Uh, and he's a, a lifelong role model for that. Thank you very much for coming to Black and Of, of significance is from the second part of the book. The first part is about the things that happened to me. The second part is called the Street Bible Appendix. Had I had a knowledge of the law at that point, I wouldn't have served 30 years in the penitentiary. It was my ignorance, and for that purpose, I know that many of these other young guys are ignorant as well. They must know these cases in here. They are the controlling Fourth Circuit cases and the Supreme Court cases as we speak. It allows them to know when the police tells them get on the ground in the middle of the street that if they have not committed a crime, if he holds them over 20 minutes, then he's kidnapped them. They need to know that, and they don't, and it's sad. 
but I intend to stop any of those kids from serving 30 to life, which is what they're giving out now. They're not going to get the 26 that I got. They're going to get life sentences. I'm going to do everything that I can to disrupt that. How important is it that you're here in Black and Nobel? It's extremely important because that's what I'm about. I want to enlighten as many young kids as I can that their opportunity and their chance to be Melvin all over again is non-existent for one major reason. When Melvin served all of his time, there was something in place called a parole board. In a case called U.S. versus Mastretta in 1987, they abolished the parole board. I and about seven other crime family gangsters in the Lewisburg Law Library swore that we would never sell a grain of narcotics again. Why? Because none of us would ever be able to serve the sentences that they were going to get out. True to form, immediately thereafter, the first sentence that they gave out was double life in 30. Uh, this is a young man named Ace Capone. He just dropped this book right here. It's called Go Hard. They just gave him life plus 50. Sadly enough, most of these guys don't earn enough money to pay a gas and electric bill. He's, his whole involvement is he wants to be seen. He takes his first money and he goes and buys a bin. He puts it in mama's name and she's on SSI. So the only problem that he's got is that somebody draws a light on it. As long as he's never exposed or discovered, he doesn't have a problem. The little guy in the neighborhood that thinks he's going to survive for, forever, he might, as long as he's a little guy. But once he drives a Ben's home and parks it by the parking, the, the, the basketball court, or his S-Series Ben's, or his BMW, and his cover's blown, the end is near. Oh, what brings here is Mel, not only just to support this brother, but I'm working with one of his brothers, Billy Stanfield, out of New York, and I teamed up with John Hopkins University, Dr. Phil Leaf, and the Tyler Brothers, and we all doing like minds in each one of our cities, and we formed a nationwide group, PMM, Positive Impact Movement, and we here speaking at the Black and Black Convention uh, as far as trauma and all the issues that's going on down in, uh, around the country in Philly this weekend. So these are my brothers that's helping me support me in the schools. I'm helping them support in their cities. We can really do this thing nationwide. And I just feel so good that brothers like this and that I have around me, we tell these young brothers, you can change. If you open your mind, take advantage of the situation and be realistic, because we not winning, we all losing. One brother kill another brother, one go to jail, one get buried in a casket. So this is a war that we losing. And once they wake up and see, and it's genocide, and it's all set up for them to go to jail and kill ourselves, then we can start transforming them once they put them guns down. Mm. See, when they send the big boys for you, the big boys don't come for a case. They have three purposes in mind. First, they come to kill you. Second, they come to get somebody else to kill you. Third, they want you to kill somebody. Mm. Then they wind you up at the same stroke. Now, if they get a drug case in between, they'll accept it but they want you off the record, off the count. The big boys play big boy style. Imagine a kid that sold just enough narcotics to be a pest, and the first lawyer he gets when he gets a case wants 100,000. Imagine this. The feds, imagine the feds caught this kid in the Bahamas, and the first pictures that they take back to his wife in Maryland are pictures of him in the Bahamas and in Brazil and all them other places and they show it to his wife by accident. Lady, sit over in the corner and shut up. Uh. What do you mean? I'm his wife and well we got you in the Bahamas also. They know it ain't her. But they show her the pictures of him in the Bahamas. She busts out in tears and tells him you dirty bastard while I'm having your babies this is what you do. You take this floozy to the Jamaica and the Bahamas. You know I'm gonna tell on you, and it's over. Change the formula like you change your clothes. The government keeps the same formula. 
the same way that they, they lied. See, my blessing was that they got so frustrated with trying to catch me that once they decided that they couldn't, they said, well, we police. Let's take the narcotics with us. And that's what I tell all these kids. Kids, when they get tired of catching you, they're going to bring it with them. When you resist it, they're going to kill you. I remember being arrested down at the Civic Center where I had bought seven season seats. They could have arrested me uptown playing pool any day that, day, that weekend. They arrested me down at the Civic Center and one little cop wants to twist my pants up in my ass to make me walk on my toes. So I'm wearing some doe skin slaps that don't wrinkle. Paid 400 for them. So I turn around and I ask the lieutenant or the major, are you in charge? He said, yeah. So I said, do you have any knowledge of me? He said, yeah, I know you. Have I ever caused any dissension or any resentment, resentment or resistance to, the, to arrest? He said, no. I said, tell this little cop if he twists his pants up in my ass, I'm going to act a damn fool down here. He said, I can only imagine what would happen in this place if you acted any other way than we would expect it to. Right. Let me take this moment to say this. I've spent 30 years in the federal penitentiary. I've witnessed 200 murders. I've never had a beer, a cigarette, an aspirin, a joint, a cup of coffee, eggnog. I've got five degrees in Taekwondo, Goju Ru, Shotokan, Kung Fu, and Samurai. Somewhere in the process, somebody's missing the boat. I'm the guy that's supposed to be used more often. And I tell them that. You're supposed to use me like Bill Withers said. That's right. They keep asking people that don't know shit. When I ask somebody to tell me something about an organized murder, I know two things better than everybody else on the planet. Murder and drug distribution. When you ask one of these guys that's running around talking about he knows something about selling drugs, about drugs, ask him when has anybody ever given him a hundred keys? that they sell for 75000 a pop, and he can pay it when he gets ready. But when you don't know much, you can't do much. And I don't have no hang-ups or attitudes. I get along with men. But somehow or another, they keep passing by me. And I'm the guy that they're supposed to find first. When they go to these seminars and start talking about drug distribution and murder, ain't nobody supposed to talk until I get ready, get tired but they don't call me. Now you can ask questions about why not. And I don't ask for no whole lot of money because I got my own. But that's some more bullshit. Do something to initiate some kind of getting black folks out of the game. They came around and they offered $8.50 in grant money and everybody was so busy scuffling to try to get the $8.50 it disrupted everything within minutes. And I told him, I said, I've only been black 70 years while y'all been kids. And it's worked every time. They come and they give one guy 30,000, 30, he alienates the rest, and now they roll in their eyes at each other. I tell them, the best you can do for me, stay away from me. Because while the other guys were taking, I've got a photographic memory. Everything I read, I remember. So I spend the greatest part of my time now with the Bible. I'm a walking dictatorial of the Bible. And I do everything that I can to live the Bible. It's real difficult because I run into roaches all the time. And it's so easy to, if not step on it. I got some guys around me, believe it or not, that hate to see me angry or upset. So I got to sometimes hurry up and catch him and say, no, don't, don't kill him. He didn't have a clue as to what he was doing. I have been around 200 murders. So I got some guys that always around me that love killing people. They, they don't kill people, they love it. I'm supposed to be used up. I'm accepted by every crime family on the planet. Something that no other black person is going to say this lifetime. I'm accepted by the Gambinos, and nobody uses their name right now because they stink. 
the Lucheses, and both sides of the Mexican Mafia. When I go, or if I choose to go to Mexico, I'm protected on either side. While they kill it in the middle, Melvin's protected on both sides. They framed me, let me, let me tell you this, since the statute has passed. They framed me and thereafter, in spite of what people think or say, I sold $1 billion worth of narcotics. One billion. I have never had a beer, cigarette, aspirin, or joint, or a cup of coffee. There's never been any money seized from me. I'm a world-class gambler. I've never lost any. So doesn't that say that it's an awful lot of money somewhere? I have, for the last 25 years, said that I was dead broke. Michael Jackson did the same thing. Do you know what black people do when you say you're dead broke? They love it. I've been on a couple of seminars with some professors from Harvard and Hopkins, and he's begun to speak. And the kids over on the on the backside would say, Melvin, do you have anything to say? So I would ask one, could I ask one question? Tell me what do you know about a body count? And this professor would say, what's a body count? And I would ask him, man, why are you here? Why are you here? I had a lady that asked somebody the other week when I was speaking about Dr. Ben Carson. I said, he's a wonderful, what is it, surgeon? Knows everything about some kind of surgery. Mm -hmm. He don't know nothing about drug distribution and murder. You gotta ask me about that. Whether you like it, like me, or not. While the information is available, don't let it pass the one. I say it again. I am open and available. Anybody wants to talk about law any hour, day or night, I will discuss it. And here's something else I do. Any one of them kids that's got away with two or three hundred thousand or a million, I can show him what to do with the money. Did you hear me? See, and here's something else that men don't do. Men don't whistle. I don't learn. I never learned. Hey, listen, all I'm going to say is real men do real things. You heard it spoken by one of the greats, Melvin, and you see that great men are coming together from New York, Baltimore, Philly, Chicago. We're linking up, and we're here to let you know that it's about growth. It's about saving lives. So let's stand up, let's man up. Real men, real things. Make sure they know who you are. I think they know. Lance Fatalo, one of the Fatalo brothers. <laughs>